The program which follows is an audio representation of the best-selling book, How to Develop Your ESP Power. Jane Roberts, the author, died on September 5, 1984. In this presentation, her role will be played by Irene O'Brien, and the role of Seth will be read by Frank Muller. I'm your narrator, Jerry Matthews. Hello, my name is Jane Roberts. I'm neither a scientist nor a parapsychologist. In fact, for most of my life, I had no particular interest in ESP. I only started to investigate it as the result of a sudden, involuntary, out-of-body experience. That was my very first encounter with ESP, and it jolted me into wanting to know more. Not only about ESP, but also whether or not there might be more to human existence than our day-to-day -day routines would suggest. The original publication of How to Develop Your ESP Power marked an end and a beginning for me. As I wrote down my new experiences, old questions from my youth challenged my adulthood and led me to turn away from my goal of a comfortable writing career in what is loosely called the establishment. No longer could I hide my intuitive knowledge behind fiction. It was confronting me as a practical daily reality. In the past, I had written down my dreams as science fiction. But now, there could be no fantasy novel about a personality I encountered who called himself Seth. The importance of his message to the world left no doubt in my mind that his emergence was anything other than pure fact. It was while writing this book that Seth first came to me, and in a way, all the books that Seth and I have written since emerged from the experiences I'll be talking about on this tape. Just what is ESP? ESP, or extrasensory perception, is just what the name suggests. Perception of phenomena beyond the scope of the commonly accepted physical senses. Like Jane Roberts, there are many people who've had at least one brush with an incident that can't be explained scientifically or by coincidence. It may have been a powerful dream, or even a disturbing incident of clairvoyance. Perhaps you've been wanting to examine this experience further, but haven't known where to begin. Or perhaps you've been afraid that others might find out about your interest and consider it foolish. Jane Roberts didn't let the fear of embarrassment conquer her desire to learn more. I was curious enough about my own experience to devise simple experiments and exercises that anyone can do. And it was these same simple experiments that brought Seth to me in the first place. You may already be aware of my work with the Seth materials. He claimed to be an energy personality essence no longer operating in the physical system. It was during my experiments that I began speaking for Seth in a mediumistic capacity, and through me he eventually dictated thousands of pages on such complex subjects as the nature of reality, the nature of physical matter, the subconscious, the human personality, the God concept, time, and antimatter, subjects I knew nothing about myself. The coming of Seth marked my initiation into a new kind of reality and into a far greater world than the one that is generally accepted. Although we don't expect you to encounter a Seth-like identity the way Jane Roberts did, you may find you have other abilities you never imagined. You may discover that you have telepathic talents, precognitive dreams, or an ability to make specific predictions. Through the exercises described in this recording, you will arrive at an expanded awareness of yourself and a sense of well-being through relaxation. Each person is a unique individual, and what you take with you from this experience depends on who you are. When my husband Robert and I began our investigations, we knew very little about what we were setting out to do. You might even say we were naive but we plunged into our investigations in spite of our amateur standing. We began by using a Ouija board. Robert and I were embarrassed the first time we used it, and the second. In fact, even the tenth time. It seemed like a silly thing for adults to do. That's because we associate the Ouija board with children's games, 
but even children find the Ouija board spooky on occasion. When it's used seriously by adults, it puts the unknown at your fingertips. The results may seem bizarre or even outlandish at first, but once you learn to decipher the language, the meanings become clearer. In the course of my experimenting and through my exposure to the personality called Seth, I've been able to gain some insight into why a device as simple as a Ouija board can be so effective. Where does the hidden awareness that it taps into come from? Or, why has that awareness been hidden from us in the first place? The part of you that deals with everyday life is called the ego. It's your conscious self. It focuses on the practical problems of the external world, and it's the self that you are in everyday physical living. That focus was an evolutionary necessity for early man. If the caveman was to survive, his complete attention had to be focused on the immediate physical environment to the exclusion of other, less immediate concerns. Any daydream or momentary journey into the subconscious could cost him his life. Although our world today has evolved into a far less dangerous place, our personality development hasn't kept pace. We remain focused on survival and the external physical environment. We're still on the lookout for saber-toothed tigers. And we still reject the inwardly focused aspects of our makeup that our harsh origins forced into hiding so long ago. Yet if we can widen our focus, even for a moment, we can actually perceive evidence of the continuing importance of the inner life all around us. Don't we perform many acts vital to our functioning without consciously noting that we're doing them at all? Our hearts beat, we breathe, we digest food, all without conscious effort. With so much of our being controlled by subconscious forces, is it so hard to believe that other functions and abilities might also be controlled at a subconscious level? The Ouija board, then, serves as a tool for reaching and communicating with the personal subconscious. When the ego, the conscious self, becomes relaxed, the subconscious can begin to express itself. With the Ouija board, this takes the form of muscular activity unmotivated by conscious intent. When using the Ouija board, subconscious movements of your hand serve to move the pointer across the board. Robert and I began using the Ouija board despite my initial skeptical attitude, an attitude that was soon abandoned. The best mental attitude for these experiments is an open, positive one. The use of the Ouija board is as follows. Place the board between you and your partner. Take a deep, full breath and relax before you begin. Both you and your partner place your fingers on the pointer lightly, since you want it to move easily. The common Ouija board includes on its surface an alphabet in capital letters, numbers from 1 to 10, and in each corner an area that indicates either a yes or a no answer. In the beginning, it's less confusing if the questions are asked by one person only. After asking, it's important to give the board enough time to reply. A good standard opening is to ask is there anyone there? Don't be surprised if you don't at first succeed in getting an intelligible reply. This art, like others, takes practice and patience. Our first two attempts didn't yield up any coherent results, at least none that we could decipher. But with the third session, we began to make progress. We started getting messages from personalities that claimed to have survived death. In our session, we made sure to include some questions whose answers could later be independently verified. We checked out the places and dates mentioned and found them accurate for the most part. Unfortunately, we couldn't seem to contact any of these personalities more than once. When you conduct sessions, record-keeping is important. Something that makes little or no sense to you at first may suddenly fall into place in a later session. With practice, the board will eventually spell out complete words, and later it may move on to full sentences. It's best to involve a third person in your experiments just to make careful records of these communications. The notes should include the names of the participants, the day, 
and the time. Having a few regular weekly sessions is far more effective than many one week and none the next. If nothing happens after the first 20 minutes, it makes sense to assume that nothing will happen. Try again at your next session. We made a strong effort to evaluate the information recorded during our sessions. Especially at first, it's wise to ask yourself some questions about the material. Does the informant claim to be a dead person whom you know to have been famous or admired? Someone like George Washington or Joan of Arc? If so, you can discount these results because they're very likely wish fulfillments rising from your own subconscious. If that's not the case, however, there are still some further questions you should ask. Do the answers you've received seem at all related to a satisfaction of your own repressed needs? Do you recognize any personal prejudices that coincide with likes or dislikes of your own that you don't normally express? Does the expression of this material make you feel particularly important or superior? Does the personality display evidence of hate or anger? Does the subject matter seem excessively religious or sexual? If the answer to any of these questions is yes, then it is most likely that this material comes from your own subconscious, that portion of the subconscious layer that remains bound to your conscious self. However, if the material displays superior psychological insights, intellectual abilities beyond your own, or a definite element of an ESP phenomena, then by all means, study it with care. In our fourth session, we made our first real progress in developing a rapport with a personality. It was the first time we made contact with someone whom we could call again in another session. His name was Frank Withers. He told us he was an English teacher who had taught in Elmira, New York, and that he had died in 1942. We had two more sessions with Frank Withers, both of them similar to the first. But our fourth session with him was different from the start. The replies changed from one word or sentence at a time to spelling out whole paragraphs at once with the Ouija pointer. My husband was asking the questions. He asked, Are you there, Frank Withers? Yes, the pointer indicated. Then he asked, Do you have a message for us? Consciousness is like a flower with many petals. Robert continued, Is this Jane's subconscious talking? Subconscious is a corridor. What difference does it make what door you travel through? Nevertheless, I can speak through her if I so choose. Once she spoke through me. Then my husband asked, When did you speak through Jane? A century ago. Seance. She was a medium reaching me for you. Frank Withers, can we refer to you on any specific questions in the future? Yes. I prefer not to be called Frank Withers. That personality was rather colorless. Of course we were surprised, so my husband asked, We need some kind of name to use in talking to you? You may call me whatever you choose. I call myself Seth. It fits the me of me, the personality most clearly approximating the whole self I am, or am trying to be. That session marked the coming of Seth, and as you know, it was the beginning of a unique and continuing experience. As you continue to work with the Ouija board, you may find that you begin to anticipate the answers to your questions. This can happen right from the beginning or it may never happen. If it does, it may be a sign that you, like Jane Roberts, are gifted in a particularly rewarding area of extrasensory perception. As our sessions continued, I began feeling more and more uneasy. I was finding that I would pick up whole paragraphs in my mind while the pointer on the board had barely completed one sentence. Complete sentences would spring to mind, but the words weren't mine. I didn't hear a voice. I simply felt a strong urge to speak the sentences out loud. I was becoming impatient with the slow and laborious way the messages spelled themselves out on the board. 
but on the other hand, I resisted the urge to speak up. Some of my reluctance came from a fear of having my own ego swept away on a tide of unknown psychological forces. I was stubborn. I would not yield to temptation, at least not quite yet. And then finally, in the middle of our eighth session, I suddenly shoved the board aside, stood up, and began to dictate. At first my voice was normal, but the words were definitely not my own, and soon my voice began to change. Everything on your plane is a materialization of something that exists independent of your plane. Therefore, with your senses are senses that perceive inward. While your regular senses perceive or create an outer world, these senses within perceive or create an inner world. Once you exist on a particular plane, you must be attuned to it without blocking out other perceptions. Survival on a particular plane depends on your concentration on that plane. When survival is more or less satisfied, then you can turn your attention elsewhere. This message was received through voice communication. It's an actual example of some of the first material we received in that manner. It was entirely unplanned, and it was certainly unexpected. From that point on, Seth spoke directly through me, and there was no longer any need for the assistance of the Ouija board. Do you find that you remember your dreams? There are some people who never remember a single one. Most people can point to very few they can actually recall, although they're aware that they do dream frequently. It may just be that some of the difficulty lies not in our sleeping, but rather in the abrupt way that we often wake up. Dreams are important because they contain valuable messages from our subconscious that can assist us in our daily lives. But since we frequently can't recall our dreams, we are denied this useful knowledge. It is very possible that in your own dreams you are privileged to receive glimpses into the future of which your waking self is entirely ignorant. When you receive valid information about the future, you have had what is called a precognitive dream. To meet the scientific requirements of a precognitive dream, you must take care that three conditions are met. First, you must tell your dream to another person. Second, there must eventually be reliable evidence presented that what happened in the dream actually occurred at a later date in the physical world. And thirdly, it must be shown that this information could not be received via normally accepted sense perceptions. One night, my husband Robert had a striking dream. He saw himself driving down a snowy hill in a car with three passengers. His ability was poor and the roads were slippery. In the dream, he commented to his passengers that the driving conditions were fast becoming dangerous. As the road curved down, he saw a car ahead. It looked like it wouldn't make the curve. Sure enough, it skidded across the road and wrapped itself around the guardrail on the other side. Robert dreamt this in April. The weather had been marvelous. Easter fell about four days later and Robert's parents came to visit. Late that afternoon, a sudden, unseasonable snowstorm developed, and we decided to drive Robert's parents home while we still could. On the way down the hill, conditions were miserable. Robert was just saying that the road was getting dangerous when suddenly the car in front of us started skidding across the road. There we were, just as in the dream, Robert and his three passengers watching the car ahead skid directly into the guardrail. I know that some of my dreams are precognitive. The testimony of my dream notebook is my confirmation. Parapsychologists know that precognitive dreams are a fact, while traditional scientists still search in vain in their laboratories, attempting to measure and quantify the human personality. My own experiences, as well as the testimony of Seth, lead me to believe that past, 
present and future must be coexistent. In our dreams, we can move among them freely. It's only the limitations of our ego-laden viewpoint that give us the illusion of being tied to a place we agree to call now. Precognitive dreaming is evidence that there is at least a part of our makeup that is not deceived, that sees from a different, wider perspective. Keeping a dream notebook is an exercise designed to help you recall your dreams and to recognize what information they contain. Buy yourself a conveniently sized notebook and keep it and a pen by your bedside. Before going to sleep, tell yourself firmly that you will remember your dreams on awakening and that you will write them down immediately. Repeat these self-suggestions when you are relaxed and ready to doze off. When you awake in the morning, lie still with your eyes closed. The dreams will still be in your memory. Write them down at once. Do not get out of bed first. It is important that you date your dreams. Also, keep an open space on the page to record notes if and when a dream event actually happens. If you follow these instructions, it probably won't take you longer than a week before you're recalling large segments of your dreams. But that's not to say you should get discouraged if you show no results within the first few days. What you're doing is setting up a new habit, and that always takes time. As you continue this practice, the number of dreams you remember will increase. When it comes to dreams, considerable confusion can result if a dream from one level of the subconscious is interpreted in the light of data that belongs to another level entirely. We will find in many cases dreams originating in the layer of the personal subconscious, the most simple of them being those that have immediate reference to daily life. While it may seem that all dreams are random conglomerations of unrelated events or symbols, we will see that one of the most important attributes of any dream is discrimination. In fact, dream objects are chosen with such precise discrimination that on deep examination they will seem to embody not only data concerning daily existence, but one and every dream object may be seen to apply to many levels of the subconscious at once. Therefore, one dream object may simultaneously represent a simple, daily, and familiar portion of subconscious life, a strongly feared or desired object of the immediate subconscious layer, an event or object from a past life, or a feared or desired event, as the case may be. An equation exists here. One dream object has reality in four or five layers of reality simultaneously. Often, while writing a letter to a friend, the thought must have occurred to you that it would be so much simpler if you could somehow zap the message over directly. Or, if you've examined your long-distance bill lately, you've probably asked yourself if there might not be a better way to communicate than using the telephone. The term telepathy is used to describe thought transference without resorting to the other known methods of communication. As improbable as it sounds, it is very likely that we all do communicate with each other on a subconscious level much of the time. In fact, it may be that such telepathic messages are received so easily and smoothly that we don't even realize it. The Russians have been experimenting with telepathy, reportedly as a means of communication between Earth and space vehicles. And the U.S. government has been funding research on the relay of telepathic transmissions to volunteers aboard Polaris nuclear submarines. But however large telepathy may loom on the world scene, on this cassette recording, we are concerned with using telepathy in the realm of ordinary, everyday living. I have a neighbor, 
a teacher in his thirties, who told me of several experiences that he had with telepathy in his own life. One weekend morning, he felt a sudden, very strong impulse to visit his sister for dinner that evening. Though she lived forty miles away, and he wasn't in the habit of making such trips, he felt compelled to travel to her house for dinner. That afternoon, he finally decided to make the trip. He was just walking out to his car when the telephone rang. He rushed back inside just in time to answer a call from his sister, inviting him over for dinner. She told him that she had thought about calling him all morning, but had hesitated because she didn't think he'd want to make the long drive for such a short visit. Another time, the same neighbor decided to visit his brother, who lived in another town, which also happened to be about forty miles distant. Although he was looking forward to the trip, he found that he had an urge to delay. To make himself feel more rational about his delay, he went out and ran a few errands downtown. When he returned, his telephone rang just as he walked in. He picked up the phone and was surprised to find his brother calling from the local airport, saying that he'd just flown into town for a visit. Each of my neighbor's stories might conceivably be explained by coincidence, although I'll leave it up to you how likely you think that might be. Here's an incident, however, about which I have no doubt because it was I who got the message. One night, as I lay in bed, before going to sleep, I heard these odd words in my head. Yeah, it's darned expensive. Who the devil's going to pay for it? Aren't there foundations or something to cover this kind of thing? And even more peculiar, I immediately recognized the voice as belonging to a friend of mine, whom I'll call Mr. M. I told Robert about it right then, wrote down the exact words, and noted the time and date. Such a strange comment. I wondered what it could refer to. I knew his father was ill, and I thought perhaps an operation was needed or some other kind of expensive care. When Robert and I next visited my friend, I asked him if his father's condition had changed recently, and he seemed puzzled. There'd been no change at all. However, when I related the words I had heard, Mrs. M. came to my rescue. On the night in question, the couple had been at a resort hotel which had been vandalized. Mrs. M. remembered her husband standing with the manager discussing the likely cost of repairs. In these words, Yeah. It's darned expensive. Who the devil's going to pay for it? Aren't there foundations or something to cover this kind of thing? Apparently, he had meant to say insurance companies, but had used the word foundations instead. Telepathy appears to have a strong emotional basis. We most frequently pick up thoughts of those with whom we are psychologically close. In addition, telepathy, and we might say ESP in general, occurs most often when the conscious mind is distracted in some way. It's doubtful that we could simply will ourselves to be better transmitters or receivers, but it is possible to put ourselves in a state of mind that's more likely to let the abilities we do have emerge. This is an exercise that can improve receptivity. Take ten minutes each day to lie down or to sit quietly. Listen to your conscious thoughts. Don't tamper with them or judge them. Just listen. What you hear flowing through your mind is your stream of consciousness. When you've learned to recognize the stream of consciousness, start to ignore it. As you become more able to do so, you will become aware of what lies just beneath. You may hear words that seem meaningless, you may see pictures glow and fade. You may even hear one or more voices. If you hear voices you recognize, or words that make sense, write them down. If you see images of people you know, jot down a description of what you see. Later, make an attempt to see how many and which of your observations have borne fruit. Question the people involved as to the meaning of these thoughts. Until you've checked, you won't know whether or not you've received legitimate information.
I was alone in our apartment one day, doing what I often do if I find myself without distraction. I was typing away, working in fact on this very material. Suddenly I realized that I had just heard a woman's voice calling my name. I got up and leaned out of the window, but there was no one in sight. But because of my training, I put an entry in my notebook with the time, 9.15, and I went right back to work. About 20 minutes later, I got the urge to call a friend of mine, a Mrs. S. As we don't have a phone, I went over to a neighbor's to call. When I reached Mrs. S., she was delighted that I had called because she had some news for me and had been wishing I had a phone so she could give me a ring. Sure enough, when I got back to my typewriter, my notebook entry was right there staring me in the face. 9.15, heard a voice, sounded like Mrs. S. Your next exercise is aimed at discovering the number of telepathic instances in your daily life that normally would go unrecognized. You'll need another notebook for this one. Write down each of these stray thoughts as they occur. Be sure to date each entry and note the time. Jot down any strong hunches, notions, or other thoughts as they pop into your head even if they seem unrelated to the situation you're in at the moment. Just as with your dream notebook, you won't actually have made any discoveries until you check with the people involved. At that point, you can enter your margin notes as to the accuracy and meaning of your original entries. That's essential in training yourself to naturally home in on the signals coming in, helping to separate them from the general static of life. Let's assume, for the sake of example, that you'd like to send a telepathic communication to a distant person. The question that naturally occurs is to wonder what the chances are that that person will receive the message. The nature of the thought that is received by that person is determined by many factors. These few are the most essential. First is the original intensity of your thought. Second is your ability to duplicate that thought and the relative stability of the electrical thought unit as formed by you. Third is your knowledge or lack of knowledge of the range of frequencies that ordinarily compose the thoughts of the person who is to be the receiver. Now, your target receiver will understand or interpret your thought in the intensity range that he is in the habit of using himself. Some, or a portion of your transmitted thought, may fall within his range and some may not. He may pick up portions of the thought that are similar to your original thought. Now, I've already mentioned that emotions possess an electrical reality. Thoughts formed and sent out within the impulse range of emotion often succeed because of the peculiar nature of emotional electrical impulses. They have a particularly strong electrical mass and fall within powerful intensities. Therefore, thoughts formed under a strong emotional impetus will carry greater vividness have a greater tendency toward duplication, and are apt to be interpreted with some success. The outer physical world is unruly. It tends to force itself on us, whether we wish it or not. So, survival cannot help but be the major concern of our conscious selves. This is an outer-directed concentration, because the perceived threats are external. We are so busy fending off the assaults of the physical world that, paradoxically, we can't discover the fundamental truth of that world. The physical universe is actually far different than you imagine. But in order to discover that, you must cease to pay it the tribute of your attention. Ironically, you must turn away from the world in order to see it clearly.
When we focus our consciousness inward, we rid ourselves of the rigid limitations of the senses. And through experience, we can even learn to see past our personal subconscious to the realities beyond. And one of the best ways to change the focus of your awareness from outer to inner reality is through the trance state. A trance state is merely a condition of increased concentration. In a light trance state, you become partially disassociated from your outer environment and focus your attention inward. But while your inner self is enjoying greater freedom, your consciousness is still retained, though with a greatly enhanced ability to ignore outside distractions. You yourself may have entered a light trance state many times, though probably without realizing it. Every time you concentrate on a problem to the exclusion of all else, you are most likely in a type of trance state, even while you are doing activities as common as watching a movie or television or even reading a book. Learning how to enter this state when you want to lets you use it purposefully rather than accidentally. Listen to my voice. You will now learn how to hypnotize yourself into a light trance. First, sit in a comfortable chair or lie down on a bed. Close your eyes. Beginning at the soles of your feet, relax all your muscles in sequence. Speak aloud or to yourself that you will relax completely. Follow this procedure while slowly progressing through all your muscles. Go slowly up your calves, then to your thighs, your abdominal area, your hips, your back through the body to your spinal cord and up to your neck. Imagine the relaxation spreading through your shoulders, down your arms to your elbows, into your hands, spreading down to your fingertips. Now, imagine this relaxation spreading up from your shoulders to your neck, up to your throat, spreading over your jaw, your facial muscles, over your brow, throughout your scalp. Feel the tension leave your body, radiating away from the top of your head until there's no more left to exude. You are now completely and totally relaxed. Tell yourself that you will not fall asleep and that you will snap out of this state whenever you choose. You will probably notice little difference from your normal feeling of awareness. You might even doubt that you are actually in a trance. Don't let that trouble you. It's natural to feel that way at first. Continue keeping your eyes closed. You will be aware of your surroundings, but you will no longer be interested or concerned about them. When you've completed the relaxation technique that I recommend, continue to sit or lie quietly. The only suggestion to give yourself now is that you are filled with vitality and health. If you're in any doubt as to whether you've succeeded, there are some simple tests you can make to demonstrate to yourself that this is indeed a light trance. As you lie or sit in your relaxed state with your eyes closed, make this suggestion to yourself. Tell yourself that you can't open your eyes, that the harder you try, the more firmly closed they'll become. You'll be surprised to find out that for the moment your suggestion to yourself has come true. Your eyes will stay closed. That is, until you remove the suggestion by making a counter-suggestion that you can open your eyes normally whenever you wish. Aside from being useful as a stepping stone toward a deeper trance, the state of relaxation you've achieved has many benefits. It effectively relieves nervousness, and I've even used the light trance to help reduce my pain and discomfort in the dentist's office.
In a light trance state, you will feel relaxed. Seth has referred to the next step, the deep trance, as a state of psychological time. The waking state of consciousness is characterized by an evenly regulating sense of time. But surely you can recall an occasion when you were so wrapped up in what you were doing that you lost all track of time. You may even remember feeling as though you had slipped outside the bounds of time. You needn't be inactive to experience this state of mind. If you enjoy dancing, you will recognize the feeling. When you let the ego fall away, when you give yourself to the music, then you find yourself looking at the music from the inside. You dance more skillfully than the conscious mind, with its two left feet, could ever dream of. Your body seems to perform on its own. I stress the differentiation of the trance state from the non-trance condition by recognizing how it affects the ego. The ego is always trying to pull you back towards your physical environment. In the light trance state, you need to emerge from the ego cocoon because that protection is also isolation. A corn husk protects the kernels within, but it also hides the glory of the ripened plant. If you remain wrapped in the ego, you are protected, but you are also cut off from the wider world. Now you have a journey, a short way to go. Look inward further. By doing this, you allow yourself to open, like a bud unfolding, to the extrasensory perceptions that have been blocked before. When such an intense inward concentration is achieved, it is called a deep trance state. You can enter the deep trance state from the light trance we've already described. Assure yourself that you can deepen the trance and give full attention to your inner reality. Repeat that affirmation to yourself. It will help you to let go of your ties to the physical world if you assure yourself that you will snap out of the trance state either within a specific time or at any other time you might choose. Next, make an auto-suggestion that you are now able to extend your consciousness and expand it. Tell yourself that there are no limitations to your own inner awareness. Try to feel your relationship to the universe. Don't think. Feel what you are experiencing. As in all of your experimenting, it is wise to keep careful documentation. Initiate a trance notebook. After each session, immediately record your experiences while the details are still fresh. Trance sessions are also better performed on some regular basis, rather than helter-skelter. Don't be discouraged if you don't produce spectacular results. Keep each session under 30 minutes, whatever may be happening or not happening during that time. Remember, with each session, you are increasing your ability to recognize inner experience. As you continue your practice of the trance state, you will come to realize that there are no limitations to the self. For the self, as a part of action, has no boundaries except those imaginary ones given to it by the ego. We find, therefore, no limitations to the self, neither top nor bottom. The self is not enclosed within the bony skull. You call your thoughts your own, and yet you can't hold them. They are transformed without your conscious knowledge, and the self expands. Nor is the self limited by time and space, for in dreams 
as you have an actuality that has nothing to do with time nor space, and these dream experiences change and alter your personality. You are familiar only with a small portion of the self. You are much more than you think you are. Consider time as an entity. What is time exactly? Is it, in fact, a linear series of moments? If this is so, then how is it that we can have precognitive dreams like the one my husband had concerning the snowstorm in the skidding car? I find it a short step to wonder that if through dreams we can be in touch with the future, couldn't we make predictions about the future directly in our waking lives? I've kept a record of such predictions, and so has my husband Robert. In view of what we know now, I say that the conventional notion of time is simply inaccurate. As a theory, it fails to account for the established facts of precognition and prediction. In actuality, there is only the spacious present, so spacious that it cannot be explored all at once in your terms. Hence your arbitrary division of it into large rooms of past, present, and future. You are in the spacious present now. You were in the spacious present yesterday, and you will still be in it in your tomorrow. In the spacious present as it exists in actuality, all things that have existed still exist, and all things that shall exist in your tomorrow already do exist. You, on your plane, cannot experience such reality, except in a very limited fashion, and you cannot experience such a reality spontaneously. But spontaneity is the quality of the spacious present. Fortunately, the spacious present is a concept that we can test for ourselves, or at least we can test that portion of it that we are capable of comprehending. The existence of the spacious present indicates that it should be possible to actually make predictions about that part of the whole that we call the future. Once again, a notebook is required. Fortunately, the task itself is brief. All you need do is choose a five-minute period during the day when you can be alone to jot down your very own predictions. Again, include the date and time in the margin. From there on, the process is simplicity itself. Just write down whatever comes to mind. It could be a single word, a phrase, or even a complete sentence. It doesn't need to be in the form of a prediction. If only one word comes to mind, like the word lilac, for example, just write that down and go on to the next. Keep going until you have five items listed. Even if your entries don't appear to make sense, don't make any changes. The sense may be revealed in the events that transpire, which of course implies, as with your dreams, the second half of the task is to analyze the entries later to see how they came out. Robert and I have kept daily prediction books over the course of many years now. The entries seem quite arbitrary at first glance. For example, this is one of Robert's. One day, he included the single word halitosis. It seemed peculiar even to him. But later that day, he received a letter from a doctor, a doctor who happens to be the one man we both know with chronically foul-smelling breath. And here's an example of one of my own predictions. It's for a November 16th, and it says, A stranger in the house. As it happened, Robert and I went out dancing that evening, so the next day I marked the prediction as meaningless. Then two days later, we discovered that a friend had come over to our house that evening with a relative who was a stranger to us. These may seem like trivial predictions, and I suppose they are in one way, but in another they are really very important, 
since they indicate strongly that we do know more about what the future holds than others would have us believe. Walking through the forest, you find many trees. Time can be conceived of as the entire forest. You, however, see a tree in front of you and call it the future. You think that the tree was not there before because you had not come to it yet. The tree behind you, you call the past. You have been walking along one narrow path, but there are many paths. The forest exists as a whole. You can walk forward or backward, though you are only now learning how. In this somewhat abbreviated introduction to the world of extrasensory perception, we have pretty well shattered the old myth of a human personality tightly bound by space, time, and physical matter. And we have given you the tools to begin your own investigation into communication with the wider world through aids like the Ouija board, through precognitive dreams, and through telepathy, trances, and predictions of the future. How far you get on your own will be determined in large part on your desire to pursue these intriguing powers and abilities that we're only now beginning to grasp. According to Seth, the term ESP is needed because of Western man's refusal to accept his entire self, and that anything not detected by the traditional five senses therefore winds up having the word extra tacked on to its definition. But now is the time to free ourselves from this narrow-mindedness. We must now come to grips with the intangible parts of ourselves and allow the undiscovered self to emerge with full use and knowledge of our potential. Considering that crying need, I'll leave you with these words from one who has done much to bring about this new understanding. The human personality has no limitations except those which it accepts. There are no limits to its development or growth if it will accept no limits. There are no boundaries to the self except those which it arbitrarily creates and perpetuates. There is no veil through which human perception cannot see except the veil of ignorance which is pulled down by the materialistic ego. The inquiring intuitions and the searching self like the summer winds can travel in small and large spaces, can know of actualities that are more minute than pinheads and more massive than galaxies. The power of the human personality, in the most practical manner, can be seen as unlimited. The program which follows is an audio representation of the best-selling book, How to Develop Your ESP Power. Shane Roberts, the author, died on September 5, 1984. In this presentation, her role will be played by Irene O'Brien, and the role of Seth will be read by Frank Muller. I'm your narrator, Jerry Matthews. Hello, my name is Jane Roberts. I'm neither a scientist nor a parapsychologist. In fact, for most of my life, I had no particular interest in ESP. I only started to investigate it as the result of a sudden, involuntary, out-of-body experience. That was my very first encounter with ESP, and it jolted me into wanting to know more. Not only about ESP, but also whether or not there might be more to human existence than our day-to-day -day routines would suggest. The original publication of How to Develop Your ESP Power marked an end and a beginning for me. 
As I wrote down my new experiences, old questions from my youth challenged my adulthood and led me to turn away from my goal of a comfortable writing career in what is loosely called the establishment. No longer could I hide...